I never speak before any group that includes even one physician without letting it be known that my father was a solo practicing cardiologist who participated in absolutely nothing. Um, he retired from the solo practice at the age of 83 and there is nothing that any physician can say or think about attorneys that has not been said uh, to my face by my own father in terms that one would not ordinarily use at a first meeting. I don't do malpractice for anybody on either side of the table ever. I am far more interested in preventing malpractice than I am in arguing about the spoils of malpractice. What I'm going to do with you for the next hour is I'm going to talk to you about why I don't share the pessimism that many physicians seem to have, nor the paranoia uh, as they look at what is changing in the coming environment. I'm going to talk about why this moment in American medical history is really an American healthcare policy is really very different from anything that exists before. I'm gonna talk about why I spend my life with physicians and physician organizations and why I've chosen to do that and why I believe in what I think of as physician exceptionalism and why physicians actually are different from everyone else in the healthcare system. And I'm gonna talk about what makes physicians different. Then I'm gonna spend a fair amount of time focused on what true clinical integration is because if physicians don't clinically integrate with each other, they're not gonna succeed, let alone survive going forward. Um, after I'm done, before we begin the panel discussion, we're gonna show you a video of what engaged physicians look like, and I'm gonna to touch very lightly on the organized medical staff's role with regard to these things. So this slide is kind of interesting because while I remain post-traumatic about having read all 1,341 pages of failed Clinton health reform, and I'm of the era where I remember reading Teddy Kennedy's national health insurance stuff back in 1974, and during the Clinton thing, my husband's also a health lawyer, we walked around saying to each other, well, this is real, this is really going to happen, isn't it? And of course it didn't. Um, and I no longer read proposed legislation at all, ever, unless somebody pays me to do it. Um, and so the Obamacare, very oxymoronically named, it's not Obamacare at all, it's actually Baucus care. The real problem was Obama was sort of missing in action and did the anti-Bill and Hillary thing because they had kept Congress out of the loop. He did the opposite by saying, let's let Congress lead the way with regard to all of this. So the 2,000 pages come out. And I'm not really all that interested in the individual mandate. That's not where I live. That's a thousand pages of the legislation is about the health exchanges and the individual mandate. And I think it's a good thing. And I think it's going to turn out that it was a good thing. But I'm interested in the other thousand pages, which is where the providers live. And I, as I said, I live predominantly with physicians. And I start reading this thing and I'm going, whoa, this is not your mother's federal health care legislation. This language is completely different from anything I've ever seen. Now, think about the fact that because we are in a, a federation, so to speak, um, where there are states' rights, and the states under the Constitution have what are called the police powers, which is they control the health and welfare of their citizens within their borders, which is why we have individual state medical licensure and individual state insurance laws most of what federal law is about is money. It's about who gets paid for something that's coming from federal dollars because the federal government can't regulate medical licenses since that goes on inside the borders of states. So I started looking at this language and now with Adobe Acrobat you can actually count. This is hardly scientific, but it's a sense of in the thousand pages that have to do with where you guys live, or at least 500 of them have to do with where you guys live, the word efficient or efficiency appears some 89 times, value and value based 115 times, effective and effectiveness 146 times, and the real showstopper was quality, 483 times. Referred to by phrases like high quality, quality improvement, quality reporting, quality measures, quality data, quality of care, and quality performance. These are the touchstones of what your environment is going to be over the next at least five, if not 10 years. So what did health reform actually change that's relevant to why physicians should be leading what's going on? The first thing is hospitals are standing on a burning platform. While the, started with the neurosurgeons followed by the cardiologists um, in this lemming maneuver uh, threw themselves on the bosoms of hospitals out of the fantasy that it was gonna both give them financial security and let them live their lives as they had, and in some instances pay them more money than they were able 
uh, to make on their own. In fact, hospitals are looking at not having as much money as they used to have. First, we've already seen under the value-based hospital purchasing system that thousands of hospitals in the United States of America have had their Medicare reimbursement slashed because they are not doing a very good job of performing on these relatively minor you know, metrics that Medicare uses. These are not big deal, fancy, complex kinds of things that are being measured that were uh, forced in the legislation. They are no longer being paid for 30-day readmissions that were all related to the prior admission, and they're not doing a really good job on that. By the way, who writes the order for the readmission? That would be no one at the hospital. That would be some physician somewhere, which creates a real bond for where hospitals and physicians need to be working better. And by the way, all of the data about how the hospitals are <coughs> performing is now publicly available and their performance record is transparent. They are also experiencing a reduction in payment for HACs are hospital acquired conditions which again, by comparison with what others would measure as potentially avoidable complications, are a tiny little tail end of where the real problems in healthcare delivery in this country are. So this is not like this legislation came with a great sweeping scythe and said, oh, everybody's gonna have to change radically everything that they do. That's not what this legislation is about. It's very incremental and still hospitals are not doing well, plus we have the 2% sequestration. So a lot of these deals that you see, the wheels are going to start coming off because no matter whether there's a contract or not, when the hospital doesn't have the money to pay the physicians that they agreed to pay these unsustain unsustainable quantities of money, they're just going to say, we're going to lower the, your compensation and there's going to be a lot of uh, disequilibrium. Not many physicians realize that connected to the value-based hospital modifier is a physician value-based modifier that will kick in in 2015 based on 2013 data. So you're already screwed whatever it was that you did before in terms of how you're going to be paid. I find this whole logic completely unfathomable, but that's the way Congress set up the system. So two years ago, data is what drives the way you're going to get paid. It starts with quality, and then it's going to move to efficiency, which you should understand to be who is cheaper and producing better results. So that's the value proposition, which is better results for less money. No matter what happens going forward, you're going to have to produce better results for less money. Some people will get incrementally more money on the fee-for-service system. What we really need is a far more wholesale change in the reimbursement system, but they can't even get themselves over the SGR. Uh, to figure out what to do. So, I mean, I've spent the last nine years of my life, almost 10, working on developing a new provider payment model. How many of you have heard of Prometheus Payment? It's a uh, look it up online. It's the basic concept is, wouldn't it be remarkable if we paid physicians to deliver what good clinical practice guidelines say is the appropriate treatment for a patient with that condition? Oh my God, that would be revolutionary. So we've done that, we designed a system that does that and we have 80 uh, evidence-informed case rates. It's a not-for-profit, not tax-exempt organization. The material is available for free. Go to www.hciarabic3.org and you can find out about that. Uh, the legislation created the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation, which has actually done not so much innovation, but some. Last week they announced they're putting another $840 million on the street for physicians to form collaboratives to transform care. I see that as a good thing. The ACO demonstration, much hysteria about what is turning out to be not very much. The Medicare Shared Saving Accountable Care Organization isn't even a demonstration project. It's not a pilot. It's not in anything. It was just an opportunity that was made available. Um, it was designed around the um, American Medical Group Association concepts of what the Medicare group practice demonstration had been which as you may recall, nobody did very well on except for the Marshfield Clinic. And there were people who thought that the reason that they were the only ones that got decent money out of it was because of some coding anomalies from where their baseline was. The guys who everybody thought were gonna do really well, the Mayo Clinics, the Billings, the Park Nicolettes, they were already doing so well that when you me measured them against the baseline, they didn't earn their uh, incentives. And that's the style that CMS has used in all of these sort of quality measured things, which is you have to save money over a baseline. If you're already good, you, it doesn't work out very well. 
There was a pilot on payment bundling. Oh, incidentally, of those who applied for ACOs, it was surprising to a lot of us who were fairly cynical uh, that many of the organizations who got these contracts were physician-driven and physician-led. Uh, similarly, in the payment bundling pilots, which is the BPCI uh, model where there are four approaches to bundling payment. One, you get paid uh, only for the hospital admission and the services that are associated with that. One is where you get paid for pre-admission stuff during the admission and either 30 or 90 days after. The third model of it is bundled payment exclusively around post-discharge care, post-acute care. And the fourth model is perspective. There are more than 400 entities that indicated they were interested in playing this. It's very difficult to get information about it. The website is not very good. Um, but many, many of them were physician driven and they were helped by conveners that are organizations like Remedy Partners and uh, the Camden Group and the Lewin Group, which are consulting firms that um, stand to get a little piece of the action for helping folks come together. The moment that we're at, I see as a real tipping point for physicians. Uh, we know that hospitals and health systems are acquiring physician practices again. They are doing with them approximately nothing. They pay them on a W-2. They're not helping them clinically integrate. They've changed nothing about the value proposition. It's not sustainable in that way. In a really quality-driven world where the community-based health system is working effectively, hospitals are not going to see about 30% of the admissions that they see now that are their bread and butter. Very few people should be admitted in 2014 with a primary diagnosis of diabetes. If somebody's admitted to the hospital for their diabetes, that means something has gone seriously wrong in the community-based system. We shouldn't have people who are admitted to the hospital for diabetic stroke and diabetic amputations and diabetic eye procedures, which have been bread and butter along with the readmissions for hospitals. The payment models are changing, the outcomes are unclear, physician anxiety is rampant, and I think that this creates sufficient ambiguity that well-motivated physicians can step up into the breach and organize themselves to lead. And that is my pom-poms aloft <coughs> purpose of the rest of my presentation to you. So why is it that physician engagement around quality and value, wherever in the healthcare system, but particularly around hospitals as their significant others is so important? Well, the first reason is that physicians have what's called plenary legal authority. They have the broadest legal authority of anybody in the healthcare system. Hospitals don't admit people. They don't order the services that patients get. They don't discharge people. Physicians do that. It used to be that people used to say the most expensive form of technology in the American healthcare system is the ballpoint pen with which physicians write their orders. Now it's the mouse click as well. Virtually everything that happens in the American healthcare system is ultimately derivative of a physician order somewhere along the line. In addition, physicians are the portal to the healthcare system for their patients. This is why when the new healthcare plan comes to town, and it's what's happening with all the exchanges, the first questions that patients ask is, is my doctor in the network? Patients relate to physicians. They don't relate to systems. I love all of the healthcare advertising. There used to be a fabulous ad that Temple Health System had in Philadelphia where they had a very good heart transplant program. One of my clients who was an ophthalmologist had a heart transplant there and there he was as a consumer of their heart transplants on television going, it's a fabulous heart transplant program. What are you supposed to say? Oh, that's really good to know because I'm gonna wake up tomorrow morning and go down there and get me one of those new hearts. That's not how it works in healthcare. So this is all sort of brand branding. It's a way of creating consciousness in people that these various health systems are doing various things. Patients go where their physicians send them and where their health insurance covers their services. The, the physician is the portal to the system. They perform the most critical and intimate procedures that patients will experience. They are the mechanism that is predominantly used to explain the system, because God knows the employers aren't doing a very good job of that. They make the referrals and recommendations for further care that patients will get, and they often are charged with the task, which has become increasingly more difficult, of explaining the patient's benefits to them when the patients don't understand why they have to pay on the large deductible that they bought on the bronze plan where they really didn't understand that they were not gonna get first dollar coverage. Physician involvement in health systems can enhance results, improve the culture and foster truly effective interdisciplinary collaboration, 
but their disengagement or malevolent engagement, which I frankly have seen, one of my favorite stories is of a medical staff that was so at odds with its administration, and I got the medical staff bylaws for them, and it was a seven-year proposition. Elected as the president of the medical staff, a guy who ultimately lost his license, who was the worst thorn in the administration side that the medical staff could think of to be their representative. This is such bad leadership, I can't even begin to tell you. It not only didn't work, they couldn't get anything accomplished, it was a complete horror show. So when physicians are disengaged or they don't respond to engagement, what happens? How many of you know the story of Cedar sinais computerized physician order entry system debacle of about seven or eight years ago? Okay, I love to tell the story because I get to use an oxymoronic phrase that I don't get to use under any other circumstances. Cedar sinai decided that they were going to build their own CPOE system. Okay, there's a really stupid idea to begin with. So, because the, the, that's their core competence. So Cedar sinai is going to build their CPOE system. They have some physicians who are involved in it. Nobody really knows how many because they weren't very transparent about the whole thing. And they did something that anybody knows anything about information technology knows you never do. They went live hospital-wide on one day. They flipped the switch and everybody was on CPOE. And here's the oxymoronic phrase I only get to use in this instance. The medical staff rose up as one when have you ever seen that happen? <laughs> and refused to use the system because it was cumbersome, dangerous, unwieldy, and burdensome. Cedar sinai spent so much money on this that they wouldn't even reveal it publicly in all the brouhaha that went on. They, subsequently, everybody got over it, sort of. I'm sure it's still an issue that comes up because physicians remember their grudges with elephantine memories unto the eons. I did a program with Bill Rupp, who was, uh, has been, the, he's an oncologist who was the CEO of two Mayo facilities that were in Minneapolis, and then he was brought into Jacksonville to do the Mayo turnaround uh, there. And he tells a story that we actually documented in a paper that we wrote for the IHI, where he said to one of the guys who was on the medical staff, how come you never bring us any ideas? And the answer that he got was, I brought an idea to you six years ago and no one followed it. He goes, I wasn't even here six years ago. That's the physician, you know, once thwarted, never coming back again. This is a major problem that physicians need to get over. But so far, I haven't really told you what it is that makes what physicians do so unique in the healthcare system that they are deserving of this plenary role and this central authority and the physician exceptionalism that I accord to them. So let me take a minute and pause on that. The most elegant description of what physicians do that I have ever heard or read was written by my colleague Jim Reinertsen, who is himself a physician, who said, physicians transform information into meaningful explanations of the present, predictions of the future, and changed futures, mainly for individual patients and sometimes for whole populations. That's a really profoundly elegant observation. It was picked up by Jordy Cohen, who was then the president of the American Association of Medical Colleges, as follows. The fundamental nature of the transaction that takes place between physician and patient, as complex, multifaceted, and enigmatic as it is, can be captured in just three questions that people seek answers to when they are sick. People basically look to their physicians to, number one, explain nature. What is happening to me? Number two, predict nature's future. What is going to happen to me? And three, alter nature's future for the better. What can be done to improve what happens to me? As Reinertsen says, we take information on this hard drive about health and transform it to a higher order of information not just as an intellectual exercise, but to satisfy the three fundamental needs of explanation, prediction, and change. We can do other things in the course of our day, but all are secondary to this primary task. So in Crossing the Quality Chasm, the Institute of Medicine picked up on this, and you'll find it's on page eight of the study, the first time that they say the transfer of knowledge is care. So when a physician takes what's on his or her hard drive up here and transmit it to a patient, either through dialogue, or writing a script, or performing a procedure, or interpreting an image, that is the care that has been, the transfer of knowledge is care. And so high quality care would be where that transfer is optimized 
so the physician can standardize to the science as much as possible to be able to custom craft the art of medicine, which is to deal with that individual person whom they are treating with their allergies and their family history and their socioeconomic status and their genomic issues more and more and their personal preferences more and more. That's custom crafting the art of medicine within the boundaries or on the music scale of what the standardized evidence base is. So if we want to optimize that transfer of knowledge, and here's something that all physician leaders should keep in mind going forward as they're working on any endeavors that involve physicians. What physicians want most in their lives, even more than money, is time and touch with their patients. And that is not a touchy-feely statement. The issue of having appropriate time to listen effectively and look at the lift of a shoulder and the little twitch of the eye at the very end of the appointment when the patient says, after you thought that you were dealing with what was the real reason that they showed up, oh wait doc, I wanted to ask you about this. That's really where the transaction, that the point of them coming was about. And if we don't ruthlessly cut out of the healthcare system absurd time stealers that don't add safety, which is legitimate, or enhance quality, we are never going to produce value. And this is a primary responsibility, and it should be an authority of physicians in regulating themselves to make those kinds of judgments. So for years, I ran around saying, well, and health systems really need physicians to be in leadership because of all of these things that I've just told you about that I believe that come out of a paper I originally wrote for the AMA in 1998 when they came to me and they said, we would like you to write a paper on why physician leadership is so critical. Listen to what it was in those days in the organized medical staff, um, in managed care organizations and in physician practice management companies. That's when they were being traded on the stock exchanges before they all tanked because they, they were really real estate deals and not anything much. So it was difficult to make the argument effectively that physicians really being in leadership positions and driving the culture of organizations would make a difference. In September 2009, I was invited to a very hastily convened meeting when it looked like health reform was then imminent that was organized by Academy Health, Bassett Healthcare, which is a little integrated health system in Cooperstown, New York, where the Baseball Hall of Fame is. It's a lovely little town and a wonderful little health system which is very much like the Billings Clinic and Park Nicolette and Mayo, the physicians are employed. The physician entity owns the hospital, which is what has happened with all of these other old line integrated organizations. The Cleveland Clinic is a physician group that owns the hospital. Same thing happened with Park Nicolette, used to be Health System Minnesota. And the purpose of the meeting was to get representatives of these group employed model systems, GEMS, to come together and try to elucidate what factors that made them high value, high performing systems, which is what everybody said in the health reform debate, what elements of what they did could be replicated in environments where physicians were not gonna be employed. Because these guys understood, and it took the Mayo brothers and their, you know, their successors 75 years to build the culture of what the Mayo Clinic was. It wasn't a bunch of lawyers who dropped boxes and arrows on a page. This is about culture. I believe that health systems will not succeed without the enthusiasm and engagement of their physicians. I believe that paying them on a W-2 or owning them has exactly zero to do with the success of whether you will get the results you want by those kinds of approaches. And I believe that the real issue is having physician values drive the way these healthcare organizations operate. So here we are at this meeting in 2009, a lot of conversation goes on. There were 13 of these organizations represented. There were three non-physicians in the room. I was one of them. I'm still not clear on why I was there, but it was a very interesting meeting. So after lunch, the facilitator said to everybody in the room, I want you to write down the two salient characteristics that you believe distinguish your organization from the mediocre middle of what most American healthcare is about. And people dutifully wrote something down and then they took turns going around the room, standing in their seat, reading what they had written on their little piece of paper. It wasn't like one guy said something and another guy said, oh, I agree with him. They literally read each of them from their little pieces of paper. And to a person, every single individual in the room said something of the following. What distinguishes us from the mediocre middle of American healthcare? We're physician driven or it's a physician culture or 
It's a physician-led organization. What does that mean? This does not mean that these people don't have chief information officers or chief financial officers. They have all of this. What this is about is, are those values that physicians bring to bear in what it is they do. And I commend to you the report of this study, which includes some of these quotes, among others. Physician leadership is critical in developing two characteristics which are critical to supporting their ethos, collaboration and accountability. We'll come back to that in a second. Integration with hospitals is important as it instills accountability and promotes the coordination of care across inpatient and outpatient settings and engaging physicians in governance, not just in projects, in governance and operations is important. So what are these values that I wrote about when the AMA came to me and they asked me to write this paper? And I said, I'm gonna write this paper, but it's probably not the paper you want. And they said, what do you mean? I said, I wanna write about what it is that phys makes physicians different that are the values that I believe the American public wants at the forefront of all of these organizations. And I said, I'll write that and I'll explain it, but I'm not gonna write the paper if you won't let me talk about all the ways that physicians shoot themselves all over their bodies when they try and play these games, and I'll come back to that in a few minutes. So here's my critical slide, and when I do this to non-physicians, I say to them, this is the most important slide I am gonna show you for anything that has to do with physician engagement. These are the immutable values that physicians bring to the table that I believe are what are at issue in the we are physician driven, we're physician led, it's a physician culture. The first is you can talk about population health. You can talk about paying attention to value. Physicians feel a direct one on one responsibility for individuals that they treat one by one. The person sitting in their office, the person lying on the table, the person in the bed when they are rounding at the hospital. They treat individuals, they do not treat populations that will never ever change. The second point is something I've never seen written about, physicians never talk about it, but I know it to be profoundly true. Every physician, and I say this to the non-physicians and the physicians, every physician has felt a searing, daunting, life-changing accountability for life and death that changes them forever. What I mean when I say that is every physician, no matter how far from training, no matter what their specialty, can tell you 50 years later, 25 years later, by name, every person they think they killed or harmed by virtue of an innocent mistake made on the basis of imperfect information on the fly, trying to do the right thing. And it changes them forever. It's why they only trust doctors. I've thought about this a lot. Who else has these life and death accountabilities? Soldiers, they don't create the problems that they're there fighting about. Firemen, they rush into burning buildings. They don't create the problems they're fighting about. Policemen, they're at risk. They don't create the problems that are at issue. Physicians actually can create the moment where they have this accountability that changes them. And so what does it make them do? It makes them feel vulnerable. It makes them feel that's never gonna happen again. And so the way they approach that that's never gonna happen again is by saying, I take personal responsibility to control everything I possibly can in my environment to make sure that never happens again. This is a really big problem in quality, safety, and value generation exercises. We need to create systems. Physicians need to create systems where this vulnerability is no longer the way these kinds of problems are solved so that you are in systems that have redundant safety factors that can help prevent these kinds of problems. This is a profound quality issue. What emerges is what non-physicians perceive as arrogance. And I say to them, think about it. If you thought that you were gonna face this kind of accountability every morning when you got up to go to work, what would you do? You would pull on your socks, you would gird your loins with armor, and you would head off for the battle of the day. This is something that physicians have to acknowledge more with each other and help each other develop mechanisms so that that's not the way they solve these problems. The third thing is that physicians feel themselves to be the legal captain of the ship. That's because the law says they are. What does that mean? That means that physicians really are concerned about their malpractice liability because they're the first name when someone gets sued. It was not until 1974, that's like not very long ago, 
that hospitals got sued when the physicians who were their agents, so to speak, committed malpractice. It was, it was called the ostensible agency uh, principle, and it didn't exist before 1974. And when you're talking to a personal injury lawyer, they'll say something like, was there a physician involved in it? That's the guy that I'm gonna sue. So what it means is that if you're engaged in a quality value or safety oriented initiative or program, you better have a story to tell about what your initiative is gonna do to the physician's malpractice liability exposure because they overestimated in the extreme. Back in the early 90s with the Harvard study that Lucian Leap did, there was data that showed that physician overestimated their risk of being sued threefold. Interestingly enough, even in states where tort reform has occurred, Rand did a study that came out, I think, 10 days ago that said defensive medicine hasn't been tamped down. And the reason it has not been tamped down and it contributes to overuse is because of this parallax between what physicians believe is the reality of their circumstances and what the real reality of their circumstances is. The fourth bullet point I didn't originally have on my list, and I started doing presentations about this stuff, and physicians would come up to me separately and in little clusters, and they would say, but what about collegiality? Now, this was a word I had heard my entire life, and once I became a lawyer, I heard about it more, because my father was very big on saying, you know, medicine is a collegial prep. Uh, profession, not like you goddamn lawyers who are in an adversarial profession. And I used to think, well, what is this collegial thing? It's like, oh, we're all alone as a band of brothers. No one understands us. We're by ourselves with our terrible accountabilities. And part of it is that. But I kept thinking, why do they keep bringing this up in quality conversations? And I had this little light bulb moment when I thought, wait a minute, physicians are trained to share their intellectual capital with each other. You call a consult. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? That means the first guy has to admit he doesn't know everything about the problem that he's dealing with. Then the second guy comes along and says, oh, I will share my intellectual capital in the interests of your patient to make this patient better. That's what's collegial about what physicians do. In addition to the kinds of grand rounds things, we don't have to have a conversation about what a farce grand rounds is, but the theory of grand rounds and the theory of M&M &M conferences is about physicians sharing on a peer basis their understanding of things that are going right. Um, this is the opposite of lawyers. Lawyers will steal each other's clients. They eat each other's lunch. My husband has been in two big law firms. He worked with me for a number of years, then he went off and joined big law firms. He goes, these are lawyer hotels. It's not like anybody actually has anything to do with each other. This collegiality thing and this business about the way physicians are motivated to collaborate and share their intellectual capital with each other for the better is a very profound value that can be drawn on where otherwise independent physicians can come together and help each other. The creation of the Institute for Clinical Systems Improvement that we write about in a paper that I'll show you the uh, cover sheet for in a minute or two was a bunch of independent docs who sometimes drove two hours in the dark in the frozen tundra of Minnesota to come together and work collaboratively on clinical practice guidelines. That's what physicians need to be doing, is working with each other on these kinds of issues. The next issue that I like to point out is that physicians are science-based. Now, it's true that the data shows that it's like 17 years sometimes to get from the peer-reviewed literature like fully diffused into the medical marketplace, but that's the worst scenario. And in fact, physicians are science-based. And I like this quote because it goes back to what physicians really are about. It's from Reinertsen. He says, I think the distinction between the practitioners of so-called alternative medicine, chiropractors, homeopaths, naturopaths, and others, and those of us who claim our grounding in science, is that the alternative practitioners are often very skilled at meeting the first two needs, explanation and prognosis but they don't often actually change the future for their patients, at least not for those with meningitis or insulin-dependent diabetes or comminuted, I love that word, fractures of the tibia and fibula or infarction of two feet of their small bowel. For this is the real miracle that science brought to medicine. To truly alter the future, the doctor must have an effective craft, one worth knowing, not just a sham, and must use that craft with wisdom. So this science basis, um, is really what we talk about when we talk about the evidence base. And I will not have a conversation with anybody about cookbook medicine. I am so far over this, I can't begin to tell you. Do you know why we have cookbooks? Because if you follow the recipe, pretty much you get the same cake every time. Does it change if you're at altitude? Yes. Does it change if you use duck eggs instead of chicken eggs? Yes. 
Does it change if you use confectioner sugar as opposed to refined sugar? Yes, but pretty much you're gonna get the same cake. Evidence-based medicine, clinical practice guidelines is not cookbook medicine. Reinertsen has this great analogy of thinking about a staff of music and playing a jazz score that hews to the melody, but can go up and down and allow for flexibility. That's how physicians need to be thinking about standardizing to the evidence base. Um, physicians respond, they, they tend to be real empiricists. Uh, they distrust the peer-reviewed literature, the literature tells us, because they believe that the guys who are writing in the peer-reviewed literature are eating their way up the academic food chain and that the peer-reviewed literature doesn't publish negative studies, so it's all skewed, not to mention the taint of big industry. Um, they are ultimately empiricists that only believe what they have experienced themselves that works and sometimes what they see in the next bit. But they still read the peer-reviewed literature and they still stay on top of it and not just because they have to for CME. The last bullet point I didn't actually have as a really important topic, but I started thinking about why it is that any time you're engaged in any activity that will have the effect of excluding somebody, if you're going to form a network that's going to produce value, you don't want any willing schmo to show up. You want the doctors who get it, who understand they're going to have to change their behavior and are willing to work collaboratively to do that to change. When you have a program where somebody is going to be excluded, you'd better have a story about what is the due process for that judgment because physicians obsess about due process, not that they have any idea what it actually is. When anybody's ox gets gored, oh, they're going to jerk his privileges at the hospital. The first thing his buddy says is, where is his due process? Due process is a constitutional idea that says you are entitled to that process which is due under the circumstances to evaluate what went on. I go, why do physicians love this so much? I was in the same seventh grade that they were. I mean, and I'm an actual lawyer, and I don't have that kind of reaction to the whole thing. Here's what I figured out. Due process is like the scientific method. In the scientific method, you have a hypothesis. He's a lousy surgeon, we're gonna jerk his privileges. You test your hypothesis in the crucible of experimentation repeatedly to see if you can replicate the results. In a fair hearing, you see if you can test the basis of the hypothesis in the crucible of cross-examination and the evidence. So you get to question people, you get to delve into the evidence upon which you're relying to make the judgment. The scientific method, you take your data and you go back and reanalyze it and you revisit your hypothesis. In due process, you take the information that was adduced from the testimony in the cross-examination, you reevaluate the data in light of a hypothesis and you either modify what the decision was or you go forward with the decision. It's not efficient, but it's fair and it's a whole lot better than a wild ass guess. So from my perspective, that's why it resonates for physicians to go through this orderly mechanism whereby the, the bad adverse judgment may come out on the other end. And all physician leaders need to be aware of that. Now we're going to move to clinical integration, which to me is the sine qua non of your futures. We're going to talk about what it is, why it matters, and I'm going to reemphasize that you will not succeed if you do not engage in this. You may not even survive, but won't succeed. You may recall back in 1996, that was the first time people were banding around the concept of clinical integration. It was when the AMA was gung-ho physician unions. There was a dumb idea, I said it then, and I say it now. When you are in a union, there is one contract for the union. You don't get to bargain for it. Your leaders get to bargain for it. And what that union contract says, you have to do. Work rules, benefits, salary, everything. It's like being the guy who puts the widget on the flange at the River Rouge factory. I'm sorry, I don't think that what physicians are doing is that. At the same time, the FTC and the Department of Justice published what they referred to as the safety zones for antitrust. And in the context of doing that, they offered not a safety zone, but an observation that if there were clinically integrated networks that were not otherwise structurally integrated or financially integrated, they could bargain collusively for rates. So the structural integration back in the mid 90s, this should sound like Groundhog Day to you. We're gonna form group practices without walls, which means we're gonna merge, but not really. Single tax ID number, but everybody is their own cost center. The mega groups, all the big orthopedic groups, and then later it was the urology groups with the labs, and then it was the GI groups with the endoscopy centers, we're all gonna merge 
so we can get the money from the ancillaries. Hospital acquisition of the primary. Some of it stuck, a bunch of it didn't stick. And then hospitals creating multi-entity systems. I don't know if any of you have been following what's going on in Philadelphia, but last week was the wild, wild west. Abington and Jefferson announced that they were doing a co-equal merger. Say what? Jefferson is an enormous academic medical center. Abington is a standalone community hospital on prime real estate in Montgomery County that has always been profitable because of the patients that they draw on. Co-equal in this merger. Mind you, last year, Jefferson just got rid of the mainline health system that they were in an alliance with. They are now independent, and Einstein had been in the pile and now we're out. So that's the Jefferson story. I'm doing the medical staff bylaws for the Lancaster General Hospital, which is like an Amish country, way outside of Philadelphia. Seven o'clock in the morning, the chairman of the bylaws committee begins the meeting by saying to me, hey, did you hear that we're consolidating with Penn? I said, excuse me, what does that mean? Well, no money will change hands, but we'll be absorbed into the Penn system. Penn is going into Amish country? Are you kidding me? They're in West Philadelphia. I mean, this is it, it, forming multi-entity systems. The la who knows? The last integration, do you remember all the stupid IPAs that never really got any contracts, that everybody ran down the hall with their $500 going, I don't know what it is, but don't leave me out? The reason that it didn't work very well was because the only model that physicians could engage in was the messenger model because they were neither structurally integrated nor clinically integrated. So the messenger model is like AOL, you've got mail. You get the network of physicians together. They're not allowed to bargain around fees. You're allowed to collect what each individual group or each individual physician is willing to accept as a fee. And you turn around as the network and you give this entire list of these things to the payer and you go, AOL, you've got mail. This is our messenger model of what the fees are that we'll accept. Or the obverse of it is, the payer comes to the network and goes, this is the fee schedule we're offering, AOL, you've got mail, and you turn around to the network and say, how many of you want to play? It's very weak. It doesn't really accomplish anything. Financial integration was tough, and it was basically limited to on the other side of the San Andreas Fault and up in Lake Wobegon. Most people did not get financial integration of global capitation or specialty capitation. Primary care cap, there was a fair amount of, but primary care cap is not, it's not really any kind of full integration sort of approach. It's just being paid one by one by one for the patients who come or who don't come. And now that we know what a medical loss ratio is, we know that if your medical loss ratio is higher than your premium dollars, you've got really bad actuarial risk. Can you spell Allegheny? Worst bankruptcy in the history of healthcare. They had a medical loss ratio, I think the number was 96% and their premium dollar was like in the high 70s or low 80s. That violates a principle that the former governor of Pennsylvania used when he was running for president of the United States. And Milt Schapp, who had been a businessman who owned a uh, cable company was at one of these presidential debates, and I use the term very loosely, which really consists of journalists asking the candidates a bunch of questions. And the question was about the budget deficit, as long before Clinton ever eliminated the budget deficit. And they got to Milt after everybody had said what they were going to do, and Milt said, well, you know, I'm a businessman, and we learn a very fundamental principle when you're running business, which is your gazintas have to be more than your gazautas. And I remember sitting there with my husband and going, did he just say what I think he said? And one of the moderators said, oh, Governor, would you expand? And he goes, yes, the money that goes into your bank account has to be more than the money that goes out of your bank account. When your medical loss ratio is the opposite, your gazintas are bigger than your, oh, not bigger than your gazintas. So my view is that all of that kind of clinical integration to bargain collusively over rates is a waste of time, and it's not going to get you where you need to be. What is real clinical integration? And this is a definition that Jim Reinertsen and I came up with that we published in 2011. And we think that while physicians certainly can integrate with other organizations and should, that it is more important that physicians clinically integrate with each other. So it means physicians working together systematically, not periodically, not episodically, not project by project, not when the surveyors are coming. It means physicians working systematically as a cultural touchstone of what it is that they do, with or without other organizations and professionals, and increasingly it will be with rather than without, but at a minimum, it's got to be physicians with each other, to improve their collective. Not we're all alone like little Tasmanian devils whirling in our own dust clouds. 
where we actually are going to hold hands crossing the street to work collaboratively to help each other accomplish what it is that we want to do. And that does not mean you have to be in the same group practice. It does not mean you have to live in each other's wallets. It doesn't mean that you have to give up the autonomy of the way in which you function apart from the clinical side of where you really want to begin to have more meaningful conversations with each other to deliver high quality, safe and valued care to their patients and communities. What's different about clinical integration today? The first thing is everyone's being measured. It's public. It now will affect payment. And so your scores are going to matter. So paying attention to data, 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 and data is the key to what it is you want to be collaborating about. Here are some quality truisms I learned from being on the board of NCQA for 12 years. You cannot improve what you do not measure. You cannot improve what you do not measure because you don't know that you have improved if you don't have a baseline that you can point to and say, now we're better than we were before. The second is what gets measured gets done. So be careful what you measure, because when you choose this, people will pay attention over here, and there will be some slack that will fall off over there. And Rand has done some studies that generate this. By the way, did you know we have overuse in the United States of America? So the goal of real clinical integration is to facilitate better coordination and interaction among everybody involved with the patient, to develop data, 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 to change behavior, to produce better outcomes, better patient experience of care with more safety, more efficiently. This is the paper where we first published the definition of clinical integration and where we use the ICSI example and three other examples of very different but clinically integrated organizations. There's no one way of doing this, and the point is no matter what architecture you live in, you're gonna have to pay attention to this. We also created a clinical integration self-assessment tool. I've given you a link to it, it's free. We now have a library of three additional versions of this. One, if you were a bunch of independent physicians who wanted to come together and form a little network without merging your groups. Another that some Canadian colleagues came up with uh, after we did a couple of presentations in Canada, and they have the same problems, amazingly enough, even though they have a national health system. Um, health service. Uh, and the third is the most recent one, which is uh, where Jim did a version of it where he focused more on hospital-employed physicians that aren't really doing a whole lot. Let's look at what this clinical integration self-assessment tool looks like, because I would encourage you to take this back to whatever your working environment is, whether it's the organized medical staff or your own private practice or among the employed physicians at the hospital that you're working at, or in some newly forming ACO-ish whatever that the health system that you're affiliated with is forming. So we, we elaborated 17 different attributes that we think are associated with clinically integrated organizations. And then we postulated three scenarios. What if you were barely doing it, what would it look like? What if you were sort of, meh, you started, but you really weren't making much of an effort? to what would it look like if you were really a truly clinically integrated organization? And the green bar is basically for group practice or employed hospital physicians, and down below is a more hospital-centric thing in purple. So let's look at standardization as a fundamental element of clinical integration. So we have guidelines and protocols we want to standardize to. If you weren't really in the game, it would be each doctor does his own thing, any standing order sets are the Dr. Jones standing order set, the Dr. Smith standing order set. If you're in the medical staff, it would be, we don't evaluate physicians for their economic performance, nor do we require standardization for clinical privileges or participation in the ACO. What if you were sort of eh doing it? Well, and this is not uncommon, we adopted some practice-wide protocols, but only three guys actually use them. Or we have a few clinics and practices that have adopted guidelines and some standing order sets, but they're not an expectation of all the physicians on the medical staff. What would it look like if you were really clinically integrated? We've standardized whatever is standardizable, we're all measured all the time, and we're expected to follow the protocols that we've adopted. Hello, how many of you are there? I don't think very many. What does it look like in the medical staff or an ACO? Standardization is an expectation of all physicians. We take it into account in credentialing and privileging. Those who can't conform get thrown out. Value as a value. You heard me talk about efficiency and value and counting in the legislation and that this is being demanded of you and it's going to be posted on public report cards. What does it look like when value is a value? Well, if you're not quite there, you're saying in your group practice, our job is high quality care as we define it, period. Higher quality always costs more, lowering health care causes someone else's problems. 
You better not be there. You guys think you're leaders? I'm hoping that the fact that you took a Sunday afternoon to come and listen to this kind of a presentation means you are well beyond that particular idea. Oh, well, in our practice, operating costs or overhead are influenced by how we practice. We need to reduce overhead to maintain margin, but it's sort of a business necessity. It's not really a value of the way we do business. Wouldn't it be different if you said in your group, we actively manage overuse, both in our group and in our larger referral community. Our job is to deliver the same or higher quality at ever decreasing overall cost, whether by decreasing overuse or overhead. If you're in a health system that doesn't get it, you're all about no margin, no mission. We focus on revenues. If you get it really properly, look all the way to the right. We are intensely focused on how we can work with our physicians to create better value in terms of improved quality at the same or lowered costs. We provide actionable data to the physicians on a contemporaneous basis and then support them in helping us effect meaningful change. This is our mission. That's what the future of healthcare should be looking like. I'm not going to run through all of this. The point is that we have these 17 attributes. They may not be the right attributes for your organization. But this helps physicians and working with administration and working with your management really start to think about, well, really, where are we? And how far would we have to move and what would it take to move us to get to the right side on this particular attribute? We organize it around what we call the four Fs, which is the function of the organization, the finance, the form, and the feeling, which is culture and values, teamwork, physicians being used and everyone being used at their highest and best use. I commend this to you as a tool that you can bring to bear in beginning to get clinically integrated with those that you would hope to be leading and clinically integrating with. My point is clinical integration of a type that is not typical today is the essence of what is required by the market, by regulation, and to simply survive regardless of the architecture in which it occurs. This is the slide about how physicians shoot themselves all over their bodies when they try to play this game, saying that they are going to be leaders or that they want to be brought to the table as serious players. I've put it in the positive voice. There are negative ways of characterizing all of this. The first is consistent attendance, which means you need support from your practice colleagues. When you're going to a meeting that is going to take one hour of your time, do not take beeper call and walk out of the meeting for the one hour that you have taken out of your practice to sit and have dialogue about something that was important enough to go there, one of your partners can respond to beeper call. When physicians show up late and they walk in and out, you get no continuity of dialogue and it's crappy, crappy process. The second thing is maintain confidentiality of sensitive information. You run, want to run with the big dogs and be at the hospital getting strategic information? Don't go bandying about in the lunchroom. You have to respect the confidentiality and the seriousness of the information you're being given access to as a leader. There's a lot of problems with physician leadership. You guys are recognizing that because you're trying to get better by being here. There are sometimes worse problems with physician followership. You've heard about the herding cats. Bill Rupp had a great line where he said, no, it's like a swarm of bees. If you swat one, they'll all turn on you. My favorite was a guy who said once when I was talking about physicians working together, he was a surgeon, not surprisingly, says, you know, Ms. Gosfield, eagles don't fly in formation. I thought, oh, birds of prey. I'm not sure that would have been the analogy that I would have chosen. <laughs> the real issue is that Followers have to trust their leaders, but they only trust their leaders when their leaders are transparent and open and function as a conduit, where the information goes both ways. I can't tell you how many times hospital people have said to me, we involved doctors in the initiative. I said, who knew? Did you publish it in a newsletter? Did you send out a notice to all the doctors about who the doctors were you were talking to with regard to all? They go, well, no, we thought the doctors were going to do that. Well, the doctors should do that but they frequently don't. Demonstrate courage. What I mean when I say that is that research, this is a quote from two sociologists. Research suggests that once a single person visibly breaks conformity and offers an alternative point of view, others are far more likely to follow. Depending on the context that you're in, this is really, really important. Um, you heard that I sat on four committees in the Institute of Medicine of the National Academy of Sciences. The first one that I sat on was about utilization management issues. 
back in the late 80s. It was one of the most exciting things I'd done. You sit in a room you know, with the smartest people in the country on these issues and contend about what public policy should be. I thought it was really exciting, very intellectually interesting. I met a lot of interesting folks. And they called me to sit on the next one. And they said, we want you to sit on another committee. You'll play the same role you played before. I said, I had a role. I didn't know what the, no one gave me the script. What is my role? They said, you are the bullshit detector. What that meant is that because I was non-corporate and I really didn't have much anxiety about whether anybody in the room thought that I was eating my way up the academic food chain or anything, I would say things like, I don't understand that. Does this mean this or does this mean that? And it made people really have to clarify what it was they were talking about. Other people in the room had the same thought but were unwilling to say anything about it. And then other smart people would say, no, she's right, that really was unclear. Support the process. Physicians um, really are not, they're consensus decision makers. And the same guy will show up at meeting after meeting to raise the same problem that everybody already decided they weren't going to deal with. Here is a revolutionary concept for physicians. Take a vote. Majority wins. If the majority wins, minority loses, sit down and shut up and pull up your socks. We're not dealing with that issue again. So I was talking about this at a big five hospital medical staff system meeting when they had me do one of these presentations about leadership and engagement. And I said, take a vote. And this was like a three hour presentation I was doing. During the meeting, they took three votes. They were so excited about it. Oh, let's vote on that. We don't vote on anything. Let's actually do that. It's a really unusual idea that's kind of embedded in democracy. Uh, value process more than structure. This takes the form of in the olden days when physicians were being employed, and I was on medical, writing medical staff bylaws, and you'd have people say, if there are guys who are employed on the medical executive committee, we have to have an equal number of independent guys to counterbalance them. I go, that's really stupid. You're going to end up with like 40-man committees that won't accomplish anything. Process is more important than structure, but when structure needs change, fix it. This comes from the first paper we did for IHI that was on engaging physicians in a shared quality agenda. We decided that that was not enough, which is why we moved to achieving clinical integration. Uh, my point is that there is work that has been done on how to go about doing this, and I would commend the other IHI paper to you. In conclusion, how many of you read Atul Gawande's book, Better? For any of you who have already read it, go back and read the first chapter and the last chapter again. There is an enormous amount to be learned there. For those of you who have not read the book, it is not heavy lifting, but it will make you feel absolutely wonderful about being a doctor. And what it's about is stories of individual physicians under a wide range of circumstances, purely out of a motivation for excellence, who really have profoundly changed the quality of care around them. And that's what you guys can do. So let me talk about things that he talks about, which are diligence, doing it right, and ingenuity. Diligence, he says, is the necessity of giving sufficient attention to detail to avoid error and prevail against obstacles. Diligence seems an easy and minor virtue. You just pay attention, right? But it is neither. Diligence is central to performance and fiendishly hard. You will have to be diligent going forward. He talks about doing it right. Medicine is a fundamentally human profession. It is therefore forever troubled by human failings, failings like avarice, arrogance, insecurity, and misunderstandings. This is really just about people struggling to do the right thing. Ingenuity, which I love. Thinking anew, ingenuity is often misunderstood. It is not a matter of superior intelligence, but of character. It demands more than anything a willingness to recognize failure, to not paper over the cracks, and to change. It arises from deliberate, even obsessive reflection on failure and a constant search for new solutions. In the last analysis, he says, and this should motivate you going forward, betterment is a perpetual labor. The world is chaotic, disorganized, and vexing, and medicine is nowhere spared that reality. To complicate matters, we in medicine are also only human ourselves. We are distractible, weak, and given to our own concerns. Yet, still, to live as a doctor is to live so that one's life is bound up in others and in science and in the messy, complicated connection between the two. It is to live a life of responsibility. The question then is not whether one accepts the responsibility, just by doing this work one has. The question is, having accepted the responsibility, how one does this work well. That's what leaders are about, so go get them. Okay, so let me explain a little bit about this video.
This is a video that is an excerpt of seven minutes from a 45 minute video that was created by a guy who's, who I happen to know is a, a filmmaker who um, was hired by the American Board of Internal Medicine Foundation to sort of help stimulate physicians to be motivated to be involved in uh, quality improvement. And he contacted me and he said, well, I'm coming to Philadelphia because I'm going to the foundation and here's the video, why don't we have lunch? And I thought, oh God, I don't want to watch the video. And I turned it, I thought I'll watch it for three minutes. And I turned it on and I was just riveted for 45 minutes. This video is a specific uh, excerpted video that I designed what was gonna be in it. Each of the people who is speaking on this video speaks to a specific technique you should think about as you work on quality issues. So here we go. I went to see a patient here and, and as I started to think about how to care for this patient for asthma, I thought, geez, I think there's these new guidelines out from the National Heart and Lung Blood Institute. I couldn't find the guidelines, but I sort of vaguely knew what I needed to do. I couldn't find anybody to help me to do the peak flows. I ended up getting through as we usually do. But it took a long time and I thought, this is crazy. So we did a chart review and we looked at the key outcomes that people said we needed to track. And whether they had an action plan or a school plan, whether they had gotten a flu vaccine. And we showed that we were doing a horrible job. We gathered everybody together and said, how could we do it differently? All I really wanted was a stamp so I could put the peak flow. But then I had some people, and this is what made it different, I had people around me who believed in me and believed in the project, more importantly, and said, you know, I think instead of a stamp, why don't we just change the encounter forms? And you know what, Tori, you don't need to do that peak flow. What about the CNAs doing it? So then we were starting to engage people in this process. It became something bigger. I started here as a medical director in 1998, and part of my job was to do some kind of quality improvement. The first thing we did was, uh, in trying to improve our diabetes care, was to look at what the standards were. And then we saw, whoa, we've got some improvement needed here. And then we disseminated the results to our doctors who, of course, didn't believe it. They thought that they were doing just fine. Um, but then they realized when the data was in front of them that, oh, there was room for improvement. We saw that we can, you know, by paying attention to these things, we could really um, do a better job. If you don't have a clear aim, if you can't state in a sentence or two what you want to do, you're never going to bring somebody along with you. Okay, how about a big breath? So we were able to get all of us together and say, okay, let's be specific. What do we want to do? We want to improve flu vaccine rates. And that was something internal medicine could buy, family practice could buy. So we tried to figure out what the messages were that would bring other people on board, which would then help us with our overall project. When I have our staff meetings, I have a graph which I'll show, and there's not any doctor's names in particular, but their secret code number, which only they know. So they can look and see how they're doing compared to the group, because I think competition helps. Most people always thought they did better than what the um, audit showed, but I think mostly they're, they're happy with it because it helps them do a better job. And I think we're all in it to do a better job. The whole point of this is to try to make it easy. The staff is very actively interested in competing with other uh, practices that are in the consortium because when we, we go to these meetings, you want to be the best. We have a graph that lists the, the basic parameters of the performance and the outcome data that's being collected. And when you get at or above the national benchmark, then you get a gold star. Not bonuses, not reimbursement, but a gold star was incredibly effective to, to get the staff involved with it. It works? Yeah. We all here want to feel like we're doing better for our patients. And uh, measurement really does help. And that, again, is what shook us up at the beginning, and it shakes people now. Now, acting on that is not necessarily easy. Um, and there's a limit to how much one doc can do using his own or her own memory. Um, and pen and chart, but we're able to show that you can improve some things that way um, with commitment and then the tools to become more organized and do it. I think to get improved outcomes you really need to create systems in place to make it easy for providers to do the right thing and, and by creating you know types of flow sheets for diabetes we have a flow sheet for diabetes it makes it it makes the life of the provider easier to make sure that the patient is receiving standard of care we've done the same thing with asthma by implementing our asthma action plan and the chart 
and then really we worked individually with those patients and get them standard of care. When we were developing our uh, acute care sheet, that went through multiple iterations before we got to the final one that we now send to the printer. And that was done using this uh, cycle of improvement until you reach the goal that, uh, that you're looking for. All of our processes are recorded electronically on a format that has the ability to capture data. And when data is captured, uh, then it's reportable. Do we have any idea when uh, we're going to reduce scans? The first query we did, we found we actually treated women with lung cancer less aggressively than we did men. And so we came back and, and discussed that and changed our behavior altogether. It was a real eye-opening experience that has created actionable knowledge. It was not something we wanted to see, but it's something that was very important for our patients. Our goal with electronic information management is knowledge. It's knowledge that changes behavior. When we started in year 2000, our average hemoglobin A1C for the clinic was 9.4. At that time, we had 1,300 diabetic. In 2004, we had 2,150 diabetic with an average hemoglobin A1C of 7.6. You know, that is impact. I mean, when you see, if you know that with every drop in one percentage point in hemoglobin A1C, you reduce mortality and morbidity by 20%, having a drop of, you know, almost two percentage point, that's a tremendous impact on these people's lives. And I think that, that to me is very rewarding. That is very rewarding. Since we employed, started to employ all of our quality indicators and our quality mechanisms, it's changed everything for us. It's changed our attitude. It's changed our communication uh, internally because we are always looking for new ways of doing things. And people come to us all the time internally and say, why don't we measure this or that? And when it does, it's, it's like always renewing. This is the best of all times for me because I know I'm doing something that's meaningful. I know I'm doing something that's measurable. We can make a change in our own practice, how we practice personally uh, every day in the quality of our care that we give our patients. It changes our lives. It does get us up in the morning.